Great. Welcome, everybody. Uh, welcome to our RTI SLD teams. And on behalf of the MTSS statewide initiative and team, my name is Jen Collins. And we're really, really excited for today's session and for you to be a part of today's session and to glean what you can uh, as you move forward with your RTI SLD efforts within the confines of building a healthy multi-tiered system of support. So I'm joined today by our presenters uh, who hopefully you can see, uh, Karen Brady, who serves as our MTSS regional lead uh, in the central region and uh, Dr. Erica Karudar, who is our lead for the School Psychology Initiative in Pennsylvania, and Dr. Drew Hunter, who is the lead, a uh, regional lead for our behavioral initiative, um, which is, has been renamed, and I won't go into all that, but the three of them um, are going to be doing most of the presenting today. What I did want to open up with you today, uh, start with you, is by showing you um, this slide, which uh, represents um, to some of you, this might be um, familiar. For others of you, maybe it's new, but it represents um, what we call a comprehensive data gathering process when we um, move to eligibility decision making and we're conducting a comprehensive evaluation. And what I want to point to you is uh, criterion two. So if you can follow my cursor here, um, today it is very much focused on. Um, criterion two and specifically um, using um, tier three um, uh, as uh, your basis or fertile ground for determining um, uh, whether students are responding to what we call scientifically based or evidence-based intensive intervention in addition to what they're receiving um, through core instruction. And so uh, we're talking a lot today about um, intensive problem solving, intensive instructional uh, provisions, intensive intervention provisions, so that we can make decisions about response or growth as a function of those supports and services that we put in place. And the problem solving team has really got to wrap around those practices and, and processes at tier three. So on our site visits, we've been talking to you um, about the health of your multi-tiered system of support, starting with the health of tier one or core instruction, and then also assessing the health of advanced tier support. And um, in this case, with a primary focus on what we're doing at tier three, and um, hoping that the majority of students who, who receive tier three supports at the secondary level or at the elementary level um, are responding um, positively. And positively means as evidenced by above typical growth. So um, uh, that's what this slide is about. That's what criterion two is about. And as you move through this year in the series, um, maybe you're not at the point where you want to apply to the Bureau. And remember, it's, it's really an acknowledgement that you've completed the application that we went through um, a few times ago. Um, and in good faith, that's the model that you're going to use. Um, you don't have to do that this year. No one's going to force you to do that ever. But the goal of this series is to make a fundamental shift in how we see um, specific learning disabilities manifesting. And um, our belief, our position is that the, the way we really um, find the students who are candidates for specially designed instruction who have bona fide disabilities is through this process of pouring in medicine and seeing how students respond to that medicine in, a, in the context of a healthy multi-tiered system of support. It is not uh, necessarily by looking at a significant discrepancy between ability and achievement. So, uh, and of course, criterion two also exists in concert with criteria criteria is uh, one, two, one, three, and four. So um, I just wanted to say that up front um, that uh, this is an important day. So uh, we hope you got some sleep and had a good weekend and you're, you're feeling refreshed to get started with Monday. So I'm going to uh, exit out of this and get to our next piece.
and just ask again if my colleagues can see this and give me a thumbs up. No, okay. <clears throat> you might have to reshare screen the green arrow. Yeah, here it is. Sorry about that. Now, can you see it? It's coming. <laughs> okay, are we there? Good. Okay. And Jen, do you want to be in presenter mode? Yes, thank you. Okay. Sorry about that. We should be good now. Okay, let me just skip through these initial slides because you've been through all this and hopefully you've renamed. Um, and just let you know, you'll have a lot of opportunities um, today to interact. Uh, one is through our breakout rooms, of course. And then there might be some opportunities to do some emojis or raise your hand. Uh, if you want to do that or ask to do that um, at on your controls, you should have a more area. And if you click on more, um, that should give you the opportunity to do some of those things. Raised hand, indicate yes or no, um, thumbs up if, if you're good with the pace, et cetera. Um, and then uh, we just wanna talk a little bit about the objectives today. I alluded to this focus on tier three problem solving. Uh, we are going to just do a brief review. We've talked a lot about class-wide intervention in this series as part of the beginning efforts um, of, of what we do. Um, so we're going to review that briefly and then go into um, a deeper dive into evaluating what you do have in place in terms of tier three supports and services and this whole problem solving process and what it entails in terms of uh, people and um, practices. And then also review um, strategies that involve families in the tier three problem solving process, process. That's a part of the requirement of the series this year that you do engage uh, the family of the case study student as an exercise in taking steps toward um, uh, what meaningful uh, family engagement might look like at the tier three level. Um, and then identify components of intensive intervention and what we call data-based individualization. So those are the main objectives of today. And uh, one last thing for, for my part, and that is, is to just keep um, on the front burner this difference between MTSS, which is the overall framework with the components that we're working on to get in place into the fire simultaneously and with fidelity, standards line core instruction, um, uh, evidence-based tiered supports and services across the domains, the academic domain, the behavioral domain, and the social emotional domain, family engagement, ongoing professional development, um, and there are many others, including shared leadership. So that's the overall framework. And um, uh, that's to be differentiated from the responsiveness to intervention process, which is an assessment process where we are trying to capture growth that students have achieved over a reasonable period of time as a function of pouring in increasingly intensive medicine um, across the tiers and um, particularly at tier three. So we can't um, close gaps for students through tier one alone, can't close gaps for students through tier three alone. They've got to work together. And uh, when they do and they do that well, you have what we call a healthy tiered system. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to um, Dr. Karudar and stop sharing. And um, she can take it away. And hopefully she has more facility than I did.
Good morning, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us. Just a quick note I posted in the chat. If you haven't had a chance to do so already, please do use the renaming, starting with the number of your LEA first. So really pleased, um, really excited to see the um, how much people have embraced this notion of class-wide intervention. It's often really underutilized in an MTSS. And in, in having the opportunity to visit many of you on site visits, we're really excited to see how many people uh, have, have started to look at their data in this way. And we're just gonna do a really quick review of this. But many of you have determined that um, there is a need for class-wide intervention. So as we think about um, looking at our data, uh, we want to, you know, consider a few things. Number one, kind of the big picture is it is our system working for at least 80% of our students. Um, if not, we need to do some additional analysis. Uh, number one is the problem um, common for more than 20% or more of learners is the common is the problem more common for 5% of learners for an identified group, for example, students who are English language learners, or is the problem really rare and specific to a particular learner? This is one we really will talk about, and, and as we'll get into more depth today, when we analyze at the individual level. But when the answer is, you know, um, it's more common for more than 20% of our learners, or uh, it's common for more than 5% of learners in an identified group, we really want to go back and analyze at the group level. When we have large percentages of students that are experiencing difficulty, analyzing the problem at the individual level isn't going to be the most effective and efficient way, as Dr. Collins mentioned, um, tier three in and of itself isn't going to address that. So just as a quick review, um, so when we think about universal screening, one of the benefits of instituting universal screening for all students, not just for math, but also for um, literacy is that we can determine if performance is a result of individual students or classes of students. And this is where, class-wide intervention um, and looking at class-wide data are, are so important. So in our decision-making process, we'll just review this really quickly, but we want to be able to review the, the data using consistent rules. And we'll talk about the median here in a minute, um, but in protocols for decision-making so that we are ensuring we are looking at that entire system. We want to know, you know what are, um, the risk criterion or benchmark measures, if they're not already defined by the publisher of the universal screener, we really want to use screeners that are technically adequate, that are good at determining who's at risk and who's not at risk. And we wanna be able to determine what level is the problem occurring. So is it a school-wide, a grade-wide class or individual student? And if you want to go back and check out Dr. Matt Burns' video, I'm sharing it with some teams last week. I think that it's already had like 3,500 views since September. So this is, this is really something that's resonated with our teams. But just as you think about that, um, looking at screening data, your false screening data, and you're looking at, um, at your data overall, often we want to jump to Okay, um, you know, we look at our screening data and then we start selecting students for tier two or tier three. And we often miss that step of class-wide. So let's just take, for example, a quick review. We're looking at each class and we're looking at that median score. So when we think about the median, it really represents the number of seats in that classroom. When we use the mean, that statistical average, it can really be skewed by outliers. So the median is kind of that best measure. And so we take the scores on whatever measure we may be looking at, highest to lowest score for that class of students. And let's say that cut point for risk is a score of 20. So kind of going through this process, 
is that class median, that middle student in that class, if we have 25 kids and student number 13, that median scoring, is it below the risk criterion? So let's say it's not, that median score is 25 and our cut point for risk is 20. Then we're, we're good to move on and start selecting students for tier two or tier three intervention. But if that class median is say an 18 and our cut point for risk is 20, we know that we have a class-wide problem. So we're going to want to do some additional problem solving. Is it a grade-wide problem? Do more than half of, um, more than half of the grades have a grade-wide problem? So we're looking at, you know, if we have our our, um, sixth, our sixth grade, our fifth grade, our fourth grade, and all of those grades are having uh, more than 50% of classes below that risk point, then we probably need to move up that problem solving level and think about school-wide. If we notice, you know what, it's, it's just second grade that most of the classes are below that cut point for risk, then we wanna problem solve at the grade-wide level. But something we can really immediately do for any class when that median score is below uh, or is below that risk criterion is interve intervene for a class-wide problem. And we had the opportunity to learn about some wonderful class-wide interventions. So that's just a review. I encourage you to go back. Dr. Matt Burns' video on class-wide intervention has been uh, widely viewed, abundantly helpful, and that is something that's really resonated with teams as we go out and do site visits. So I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to Karen. Good morning, everybody. How are you? All right. Can everybody see? What we've got going here. We'll just change this display. Erica, are we good? Yeah. All right. Thank you. So good morning, everyone, and we're so glad that you're here today. Um, we know that you are all on a different continuum of your uh, multi-tiered system of support, um, you know, framework implementation, and then also you know, your thoughts about you know using RTI for SL determination. But one of the things we really want to talk about is helping you get a structure in place so that you feel successful, especially in your tier three problem solving uh, process. So my short section today is just gonna be about giving you some resources to help um, you know, processing how do you form a team, who is on the team, um, why is it important, what are some protocols that we can give you to help you to organize yourselves if, you, if you're in the need for that. So the process does start with a team that has unique but complementary training and expertise. So think about um, those folks that you currently have on your problem solving team. We'll talk about those members in just a moment. But each of those members that come to the team come with uh, varying backgrounds, varying education, very, varying experiences, and are coming to the team with a differing lens. Some of that's gonna be data, some of that's gonna be instruction, some of that's going to be behavior. Um, and none of us have it all, right? So it's really, really important that we have a team that's multidisciplinary and complementary when we come to the problem solving table. And a very important uh, person or uh, people that are on that team, I'm having trouble advancing, very good, um, is the family. So at the top of this team list, you'll see the members of the problem solving uh, team. And when you think about the family, that's the person or the people that have been with that, that student for a very, very, very long time, okay? So family members are there from the very beginning. And I think about processes before tier three problem solving, for example, and it wouldn't be uncommon for a family member to get a phone call from a school psychologist, somebody they've never met before, and said, we wanna to move to uh, an MDE and we wanna you know, do some testing with your child. You're gonna be you know, getting a permission to evaluate and so forth. But it might have seemed like it was really out of the blue. And we want to eliminate that process or that feeling for families. We wanna make this as collective as possible with the home and school and inclusive, you know, especially if down the road, there's going to be an MDE recommendation. You know, our goal in a multi-tiered system of support is a prevention model. So, you know, our hope is that we're not gonna to need to, to go to that MDE process, but 
after let's say a semester or so, um, depending on you know how your student is responding, you know that conversation might happen. So it's really important that we have that family member right there from the very, very beginning. You'll notice that some of the team members here have little asterisks next to them. So I did work in a school district that had a, you know, a tier three problem solving process and did use RTI for SLD determination. And there was a core group of people that were on that tier three problem solving team. The building administrator, right? Really important to have that leadership there at the table. School psychologist, that's a person on the team that has not only instructional knowledge, data analysis knowledge, but also around behavior and behavioral interventions. Your school counselor is super important to have on that team. Also has lots of um, knowledge around behavioral health and um, supports for students. Your literacy or math specialist. Those are the folks that are going to be leading in the building in literacy and math instruction. And then you might also have an MTSS coordinator or school improvement specialist. Um, that's a person who's kind of helping the administrator coordinate the process, might be doing some coaching, might be working with students. So um, really important to have on that team. So having been on that problem solving team, one of the things that our, our building would do is we would schedule a half day or a full day to meet around uh, students that um, we were going through that tier three problem solving process. Um, and then we would bring in, we would develop a schedule with 30 to 45 minutes intervals where those general education teachers or the ESL provider or the speech and language pathologist who was working with individual students would kind of come in. So we would have like a roaming substitute for those folks that needed it. And then that core tier three problem solving team would kind of remain throughout the day um, with a very um, uh, good agenda. And then also with, uh, with you know a rolling families coming in during that time as well. So those are folks you want to consider to have on your tier three problem solving team. So what do we do when we well, what's the process right? So this is a, a guidance and not a recipe, but how often do tier three problem solving teams meet? And they do meet regularly to evaluate individual student data. It is recommended that um, you would come up with a calendar. So we're going to, as a team, tier three problem solving team, we're going to evaluate who's receiving tier three um, services and then come up with a calendar of uh, every six to eight weeks, um, possibly every 12 weeks that we're gonna meet with a family and go over and review the data sources, okay? So. So we did say that these meetings last for about 30 to 45 minutes. They are individual student focused. And we're talking about a combination of evidence-based academic, behavioral, and social emotional learning practices, which is why it's so important to have a multidisciplinary team sitting at that table along with the family. And with it being an integrated approach, where a student might be struggling with academics, but you might also see some of those things um, manifesting in the student's behavior, which may not make them feel very good about themselves, right? So we're looking at a very comprehensive holistic view of that student, but we're also bringing to the table some comprehensive data, right? Academic data that you have on the student. You have maybe have some behavioral screening data that you have, and maybe you're gonna think about progress monitoring um, and collecting some kind of data on both of those areas. And then anything that you have around um, social emotional learning practices and data around that. So when we think about this tier three problem solving teams and how often they meet, these are some of the factors that we consider. So how do we document this? So we're, we're spending all this time around this tier three problem solving process we want to make sure that we have documentation of what we're doing, not only for us as schools to, um, to determine and make sure that we're doing what we say that we said we're going to do, but we also want to have documentation for families as well. So it's very important that we have some protocols in place, something that our team can follow that helps us to structure those meetings and also kind of keep track of what's going on. So I'm gonna share with you um, some data team meeting protocols that are more broad in general. And then I'm gonna share one that's really more for that tier three problem solving process. You know, just in case you don't have something in place for universal practices as well. 
The purpose of the protocols is to make sure that you remain focused and efficient during the many levels of data analysis. We know how valuable your time is. We know how hard it is to get substitutes. We want to come into the meeting with a plan and we want to make sure that those meetings are efficient. So that's the purpose of sharing some of these protocols with you. This SURF form that I'm um, sharing with you today, it's called the Screening and Intervention Record Form, is from RTI Action Network. And this is a really nice place to go for a lot of checklists and forms. I'm gonna just scroll down here. I can tell you one of the things that we hear a lot, and I'm hoping that you guys can see this. Let me just see if I can make this any bigger. There we go. Um, many times people are looking for fidelity checklists. This is a nice place to go for those just as a, an aside. I'm going to go down here and I'm going to look for that surf form. And by the way, this is also on the live binder, so you don't have to um, search for it. But I wanted to bring you to this site because it really is a nice site to have. So here's, um, this was developed by Dr. Joe, Joe Kowaleski and team. And this is really um, a screening intervention record form, starting with really distal um, conversations, looking at universal screening data, um, who are the attendees at the meeting? What percentage of students, which kind of goes back to what Erica was talking about, what percentage of students were benchmarked or not benchmarked? Do we need a class-wide or do we need an interven individual intervention? What are going to be our, our goals and our strategies for Tier 1? Who are the students that we're finding that need Tier 2 supports? What are our goals and strategies for that? What's our measurement of assessment? And then also we have, this is really just the identification of which students may need tier three problem solving, okay? And what's the measurement and assessment plan? This is a broad um, data team protocol, a good place to start. Um, I also want to share with you another resource. The other resource that you'll see here is this TIPS, Initiated Problem Solving Form. Let me get it up to the top. So this comes out of the PBIS world. Um, and if you click on this, um, this link in your PowerPoint, it'll take you to PBIS website. But this is a meeting guide as well that you can choose to use again for big conversations, but also for the individual student level as well. So this is where, who are your team members? What's your agenda? What is the problem statement that we're finding around our uh, overall universal class-wide or classroom data? What's our goal solution? We implement the solution and then we decide, did it work or not? So these two protocols that I'm sharing with you um, are helpful to help to organize the conversation. It talks about team roles in this, particularly this, this tips forms and helps you to get on the, on the same page as it relates to data team protocols. Again, those are both ones that you can use at the general universal level and you can kind of start to narrow it down. One form that we found to be helpful is this tier three uh, problem solving form example. And um, we're going to be looking at case studies um, a little bit later on today so you can really dig into how to analyze it. My point today is really just talking about the data form until we get to that a little bit later on today. So this is an integrated tier three instructional intensification goal setting form, which in the big words is this is a way you can document what has happened to the student coming up to this point in the student's career? What are some attendance health um, concerns that may be impacting? What are some data that we have collected? And then what is our plan and what are our goals for the student in this tier three problem solving process that we're gonna initiate, look at their data over a six to eight week plan, reevaluate how the student is progressing, and either continuing or making some changes. So this is a documentation form to keep the process organized and then also a way to share with families and also put in the student's file for a few, few, future, um, a future look if needed. So I wanna just take you to the example here on the next slide. This is an actual annotated Form. So the last link you saw was the actual form that you can download, modify, and take a look at the examples. But I'll just briefly go through just some of the key points here of this form. <clears throat> I'm not going to go into data and looking at the example. I'm just going to go through what is here. 
So you have, what are the instructional concerns and in current level of performance? Here you have that health concerns and attendance. What's the reading baseline data telling us, looking at a variety and a multiple of data sources? Not only our curriculum-based measure, but also our diagnostics that we're collecting pre-tier three intervention. And then we're moving on to behavior baseline data. It may or may not be applicable depending on how your student is performing. Then we have um, here, we have, this is what, these are the areas of needs or concerns. Here's are the interventions that we're going to do. Here's the person that is responsible. And here's how, this is the frequency that we're going to do the intervention. Is it going to be 30 minutes, five days a week with phonics and then adding additional um, layers of oral reading fluency? Is it a particular program like 95% group or foundations or intensification around ECRI or early reading intervention or um, some other um, important um, evidence-based tool? And then we're also going to talk about what's the progress monitoring, who's going to do it and how frequently that is. So it really helps us to solidify the plan that we're making. Then we go into measurable goals, and then we um, go ahead and we put in our progress monitoring charts and see how students are responding. And then we look to see through those progress monitoring data, our post achievement test, how does the student respond? So it's not that I'm telling you all this now that you have your head around this whole process, but it's nice to have a form to document, keep us on track and keep our meetings efficient. You have something to share with the families as well. Jen, I see your pictures on. Is there something that you wanted to say here before I move on? I just wanted to pose a question to everyone, uh, which is, um, are, are, what are your thoughts about are you under the impression that you would have tier three problem solving meetings for all students who receive tier three, uh, tier three level of intervention? Or uh, would you be judicious about who you had a tier three problem solving meeting with and why or why not? Be interesting just to hear from folks. Are you thinking that you need to have tier three problem solving meetings um, to include the family of every student who's receiving tier three supports and services or just some students? And then why or why not? So go ahead and feel free to put those things in the chat. Okay, so we have, I would imagine only progress is not being made, those that are not making the expected progress. Okay, so it seems like there's some consensus in the chat box that it would be um, specifically for the families of those students who are not responding to the tier three support and service. And remember that we said that, we're looking at fidelity of response at tier three to represent about every eight out of 10 kids who are receiving tier three. If 80% of your kids are responding to the advanced tier support that you're offering at the secondary level or at the elementary level, um, then we can say that there's, there's fidelity at tier three. Um, and we're saying if you're at 60% and you're headed in that 80% direction, that's great. You're on the track toward fidelity. The point being that um, most kids should respond to high quality core and tier three, and that the majority of schools would, would um, mobilize the time to, to really become more sophisticated about how to, again, maximize the response for the 20% that aren't, aren't quite um, responding the way we would expect. So that's what most schools do. You could have meetings on every student who's receiving a tier three support and service, but I, we don't think that that's typical. So thanks for, for offering those, those responses in the chat. Thanks, Karen. Appreciate that conversation. Yeah, so we don't wanna have large numbers of students in tier three, and we know that that's a process. Maybe you have an upside down triangle um, and students are who are receiving tier three services um, maybe that's a large number and, you know, meeting with, you know, large numbers of parents isn't possible. 
and possibly communication prior, letting them know that you're, you're problem solving around the students and then you know, meeting with those uh, families for students who aren't responding. Um, I worked in a district where we kept that cut score pretty uh, low, around the 10th percentile or below, and we did meet with each of those uh, families at the beginning. If the student wasn't responding in six to eight weeks, we would meet again. Otherwise, we'd meet in a 12 to 20 week uh, period with families. Um, so it really depends on the numbers, um, what your cut scores are, and what you're able to manage as in your system. So really great conversations. Thank you for that. All right, so the next thing I want to share with you, uh, since we are going to be including families in this tier three problem solving process, and we know that they are a very important member of the team, how do we engage families in this process? And so in the chat, you'll see a toolbox for family engagement. And I want to recognize my colleague, Sharon Hartman, for creating this toolbox. And the link is there, as well as in the live binder, you'll see resources as well. So this is for your quick um, view, but you can always go to the live binder for all resources around this series and others. So we know that you know evidence supports family engagement. So I want to share with you some infographics and things that uh, could be helpful for you in this process. So if you wouldn't mind putting in the chat here, when you're thinking about your building and how they communicate with families concerning their child's um, uh, RTI status, how they're responding, how often are you um, really reaching out to folks? Um, is it daily, weekly, monthly, yearly? Go ahead and put that in the chat. And we're particularly interested in this whole, um, you know, how about MTSS, how your MTSS framework, how your, your, their student is particularly responding. How often is that communication happening? Okay, we have, it depends on the student, one time per month. Weekly. Okay, so I'm sure there's going to be a variety of responses here. Um, and then what medium do you tend to communicate with folks? Is it usually a phone call, letter, um, email blast, uh, information meetings, communication logs? What's the mode? Okay, it depends on the student email, letter, phone calls, so a variety of things that were there. I'm asking this because at the end of this session or this session after Jen gets on, we're gonna be asking you to identify one to two things that you can do to help to engage families. So it's nice to know what you're already doing already. And maybe some of the resources that we share today might spark some different ideas as well. So the next resources that I'm gonna share from you are from the National Center on Intensive Intervention. Um, one of the things that's really important is that we are sharing information with folks. So if you're going to be meeting with uh, the parents in a problem solving uh, process meeting, it's really nice to assign a team member to empower the family in advance of the meeting, give them some information, make them feel comfortable. Here's a document that you can see there's an overview for parents and family, who, what, where, when, how, what they can expect from this tier three problem solving process. Knowing when the parents and family come to the table, when we're speaking to them, remember that we're using educational jargon that probably um, is foreign to them. We use a lot of acronyms. Um, just be cognizant that we might need to, you know, slow down and make sure everybody understands. And then after the meeting, you know, I'll follow up with questions to be sure, you know, they understand the process. Um, feel comfortable with what was decided about. And then also to, you know, follow up to if they might have volunteered to do some particular, um, you know, practice or intervention with their, their student at home. So it's often helpful to follow up with them to make sure they feel comfortable with the meeting. I'm going to share with you an MTS, I'm sorry, uh, MTS brochure. This is a parent guide to multi-tier systems of support. This is just an idea that you might want to have within your system. Um, some kind of brochure or flyer. I know we, um, when I worked at the building level, we also had a flyer about how we're using RTI for SLD determination, which I know that we're all on a different level of implementation, but you know that might be one of your goals of the series is to be able to apply to BSE to do that. 
or to let them know that that is your intent, I should say. Um, so you could have a flyer around multi-tier system support and then also a flyer about your tier three problem solving process and then how you use RTI for SLD determination. Another thing that we have here is um, an invitation uh, to come to those meetings to explain that we're gonna be monitoring progress, we're gonna be sharing information and making sure they understand the intervention plan. Here's an invitation template that you could use uh, for your families of invitation. You probably have something more sophisticated um, you know, now, but here's a, a sample love, um, letter of a student that is going to be going into the tier three problem solving process and just a, a letter that you might be able to use to help with that invitation and communication around that. One more thing I wanna share with you is that we always wanna think about the family as being you know, their first teacher, the person who knows their child really, really well. So we wanna highlight the facts of the MTSS process and that it takes time to examine and address um, a student's unique needs. We wanna encourage families to communicate frequently feel open to share at the meetings and then also follow up with any necessary information before or after. And we also want to remind families to celebrate the progress that the student is making, assuming that we're, we're making that above typical progress. And it might need, take some time to get to that grade level standard. I wanna share one more resource with you, <clears throat> which is, an um, is asking uh, for information from the parents which is a tier three parent survey. So we can um, talk to this, the family on the phone to get that information, or we could choose something like this. Feel free to modify this. It's a tier three parent uh, survey um, where you can get information about the student um, prior to the meeting to help inform some of the conversation. Also know that besides these things that I've shared with you, there's the Center on Multi-Tiered System of Support, the National Center for Learning Disabilities, the Peel Center who works with families and youth and young adults with disabilities and special healthcare needs. And we're gonna spend a lot of time now talking about the National Center on Improving Literacy. So Jen, I'm gonna stop sharing now. And then after your piece, we're gonna ask folks to kind of reflect on one or two things that they can do uh, to help engage families. Okay, thank you, Sharon or Karen. Those were uh, great uh, resources. And um, uh, one of the things we're talking with you all about on your site visits is a little bit about this informed consent process that you have or maybe working on or maybe wanting to mobilize. And so um, uh, what we what we try to help schools do to prepare for tier three problem solving is think about that informed consent that they might send out at the beginning of the year to all families, letting families know um, kind of generally that you have a multi-tiered system of support in place and this is what that means. And you're, you're engaging in um, screening for all students around whatever it is you're screening for, reading, math, behavior, et cetera. And at any point, um, you may, you may uh, be mobilizing additional supports and collecting uh, more information on students um, who uh, might need more than, than what can be afforded through classroom instruction alone. So that kind of sets the stage to let families know how you operate, uh, some of these processes and practices that you have in place. And then when um, we call them in to be a part of tier three problem solving, they have some awareness of, of um, what's going on. Uh, I am um, going to take you to um, the National Center on Improving Literacy uh, for a couple of reasons. The first thing, first reason is that literacy, uh, uh, particularly acquisition of early reading skills, but not to met, notwithstanding uh, moving into the middle and high school levels and still this struggle with access and core instruction when it involves um, some of these skills that, that adolescents also tend to struggle with in terms of reading and writing. So this center uh, was established to help you to help 
uh, administrators and to help families understand how reading within the context of language develops over time and what the practices are that can be used at the classroom level and or at home or in an advanced tier support um, to help students with this area. We'd be talking about math. I would have gone to math first if, if math continued to be um, uh, one of the, the higher incidence disabilities, but um, reading continues to be the number one reason why um, students are referred for a special education evaluation, and that hasn't changed uh, for a long time. So when we get a center uh, where we can call it the National Center on Improving Mathematics, um, we'll, we'll take you to that too. And we do have a lot of resources for math, but for purposes of today, I wanted to take you to ENSEL. Um, so, uh, I'm just going to get out of this for a second, actually. Let me just click on the link since it's here. So when you go to um, the National Center on Improving Literacy, you'll see this home page. And um, I like it because it's, it's fairly simple. It's organized um, into um, sections. So there's a section for parents and families. There's a section for schools and districts. And there's a section for state agencies. This is mostly dedicated to policy around dyslexia that um, has been and continues to sweep the country, meaning that all states um, through policy are becoming increasingly required to conduct universal screening in, in reading for all students at least three times a year and um, sort of create this state of dyslexia awareness, um, uh, eliminate some of the, the longstanding myths that people have around their understanding of dyslexia and really get to the heart of preventing um, long-term reading problems um, for uh, most children out there. Um, and then there's a section on all the tools and resources that are available to these three entities under the tools and resources column. So hey, Jen, I'd be, yeah, yeah. I'm not seeing your um, website. I'm seeing oh, your PowerPoint. Sorry. That's sorry, okay. Sorry, sorry. Here we That's go. right. I didn't want to get you too far before we, there we go. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. So these are the three sections that I just referenced. So for the purposes of today, I'm just going to take you because we we're just talking about parents and families to the parents and families area. And when I click on that, what you get, um, if you scroll down, are a whole list of options to um, show families. So there's a, there's a section on remote learning. Um, I know that um, some of you in, in working with you uh, are, uh, even at the secondary level, particularly are offering remote learning opportunities. The center right now is, is geared um, toward about, toward uh, pre-K through about fifth graders, but the goal of the center is to go all the way up to uh, middle school and high school. So that is coming and that is in the works. So there's a section on remote learning for families. Uh, then if you continue to scroll down, learning about your child's reading development, supporting your child's literacy development, uh, what are the experts saying you can do at home? Then there's a whole section devoted to helping families understand dyslexia. Uh, what's more appropriate for students with dyslexia, an IEP or a 504 plan? What's your advice to parents of struggling readers? Um, is Orton Gillingham better than other options that are out there? Why or why not? So they're getting into specific interventions. And then you can explore, you can help families explore by topic. So if I were having a tier three problem solving meeting and I wanted to empower the parent or welcome the parent in terms of speaking the same language, um, empowering them to learn more about the development of reading relative to, to their student or their child and what the child's currently experiencing, I would not hesitate to take them to a center like this because that's the purpose of its design. And then I wouldn't hesitate to take them to some of the options here that parents um, can do at home with their children, um, with your support or uh, with your help and kind of pointing them in the right direction. So uh, there's um, a resource repository here of recommended websites. These are all kind of, these are juried, they're high quality for families and parents. There's a section on improving literacy through briefs um, with infographics. And then um, if you scroll down, there, there are what 
it's called implementation toolkits. So if I click on the implementation toolkits, I get things like um, helping families learn how to effectively advocate for children's literacy needs. So when they come to the table, you know, they're, they're empowered through this toolkit to maybe ask some questions or to help interpret some of the information that you're trying to relay, as well as contribute things that um, they may have to offer. There's a toolkit on um, alphabet principle and phonics. This toolkit helps teachers and families understand uh, what these skills are and um, uses video-based instruction as well as um, tools. Um, to, with audio to uh, take them through or take you through about a half hour on this particular skill area of reading. Uh, family and schools partnering for children's literacy. This toolkit helps to support uh, literacy in and out of school. And then there's a toolkit on fluency. Uh, lots of opportunities for parents to help build fluency in the home learning about your child's reading development. Here's a toolkit on phonological and phonemic awareness. I mentioned the remote literacy learning, uh, self-advocacy and so on. So there's one more section that I'd like to take you to. And I'm going to go back to the home page, which is the page that um, you start on when you get to the center. And if you scroll all the way down to the bottom and we're sharing this with you on, um, on our site visits. Karen, can you let me know if you see kids on here? You do? Okay, good. I'm just going to scroll down to the bottom and hit play. And when I hit play, I'm gonna hit it a second time when I see the literacy playground for kids and families. So I'm gonna hit play again. And when you hit play again, you get to um, web-based and or apps that will take kids to games and or videos that cut across ages and um, the building blocks of reading and language development. And so if I were, if my case study student um, that, that, we, that you chose was maybe six or seven or eight or five, I would pick that age group and then I might hit all types of games. And then I would show the parent the different options across these building blocks. And at the tier three problem solving meeting, you know, I might say to the parent, one of the things we, we like to prescribe uh, for um, an evening activity on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday would be a, a comprehension game on Monday, a language development game on Tuesday, a phonemic awareness game on Wednesday, a phonics game on Thursday, or you could proportionally emphasize the areas that the child needs to continue to develop in a, in a, in a fun way at home. All the parent has to do is get the child to the website and then the child can be taught how to easily access and pick games of their choice. And then we just follow up the next morning on, on how the game went and what they learned and how they did. So um, this is a really nice way for teachers to, to differentiate in the classroom when children are not being directly instructed through whole group or small group instruction and or to work with parents about partnering around some of the um, skill areas that um, children would benefit from working on both at home and at school, you know, at reasonable levels. So I'm just going to pause there and um, ask if you have any questions about KidZone. Um, I will tell you that in the past with our TSLD teams and with our Enhancing Early Literacy Outcome teams, Patton has kind of leveraged you as schools that are, are really working on enhancing literacy outcomes for kids. And we've offered a, a half hour session where we take families to this site on your behalf, guide them through some of the activities, show them some of the activities and information and, and just sort of help you bridge together as a, as a family school community. So I'm just gonna pause there and ask if there are any questions about KidZone or the National Center on Improving Literacy in general. And maybe just some thoughts you have about um, the center. Well, 
when are they planning on having middle school, high school resources? Uh, their grant was just reestablished. So these national centers have to reapply to get funding every three years or so. And so I believe that these, these latter three years, so from now until uh, 2024, will be devoted to populating the resource with middle and high school resources. So that's a great question, Victoria. Thank you. And um, I think the other question was, these look, these look like great resources. They really are. They've been really, really uh, well received. Um, I think we'll give you some time at the next um, session that we have to explore the center. Um, and it is free. All the games are free. So if you get a chance today, or maybe when you meet as a problem solving team with the family, maybe get, get um, get together ahead of time and just work your way through a couple of games so you can see it for yourselves. There's much more than games too. There are listening activities and reading activities, which we don't have time to show you right now. But um, listening, reading, speaking, and writing cuts across um, games, books, um, voiceover, catered to all learners, um, English learners, kids with disabilities, kids who are struggling, kids aren't who aren't who aren't struggling, families, educators, um, and uh, administrators and state agencies. So really, really powerful research to practice site and very, very user friendly and free. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Jen, for taking us to the National Center of Improving Literacy and all the wonderful resources that are there. So we've shared those ENSEL resources. We've shared with you with the family toolkit, um, invites, brochures, um, ways to engage families, and um, all of those things there are free things that you can do. So we're asking you now, just think to yourselves, name one to two steps or changes your team can make to set the conditions for maximizing family engagement within the tier three problem solving process. So if you wouldn't mind just typing in the chat, you know, maybe you're going to create a, a brochure for your district around multi-tiered systems of support or RTI. Um, maybe you're going to make sure that your families are aware of ENSEL and other sites. Um, maybe you're going to send home some information prior to the tier three problem solving meetings. Many different options you can do there. We're asking you to type in one to two things that you might do to set the conditions for maximizing family engagement. Update the school website, resource guide, okay? Intentional sharing of resources, brochures, communication, that they're kept more involved in our process, right? So when you say we have an MTSS framework, do people know what you're talking about? Not only within your team, but also with families. Okay, a flyer brochure explaining what MTSS is, awesome. Resources for parents, follow a schedule for meeting, right? Yeah, one of the topics we did talk about was all those data meeting protocols to help you as a problem solving team function. Enhance and improve our communication with families, post tier two, three timeline for interventions on website, resources for families, good. All right, we're really excited about that. Uh, central location for parents to find all of this information, right? Yeah, all right. So. We want to keep that family piece in the forefront of our minds as we're, we're thinking about tier three problem solving and then our RTI to SLD uh, process. So I'm going to stop sharing and I think it is back to Erica. That's me, Karen. Oh, you don't look like Erica Drew. Back to I Drew <laughs> We think alike, but we don't look alike. All right. Thank you. Everyone's seeing my screen okay. All yes. right, we're gonna uh, move in. We talked about some, uh, we did some classified intervention, looked at some data teaming protocols and some family engagement resources. And we're gonna spend much of the remainder of today uh, talking about various aspects of intensive intervention and how to intensify our interventions across the tiers for students. Uh, we know that this is something that teams throughout the state really do struggle with, is how to really truly differentiate that tier three from tier two, right? How do we make that a unique and more intense experience for our students? So that's kind of what we'll be dealing with here uh, for the rest of the morning. So at this point in the process, we would have um, conducted our screening, done any type of classified intervention if indicated, 
and reanalyzed our data and looked at that data and identified who needs our most um, intensive resources and where do we need to allocate those to. Uh, hopefully we've had some, an established process and practices related to our tier three problem solving process. So we have that team of professionals and our meetings are uh, scheduled and our protocols to guide our process. And we have our families proactively engaged and empowered from the start of the process. So now we kind of need to talk about what are the essential features of advanced tier intervention and support and how can we maximize um, the, and intensify instruction if needed. So we're gonna have you do an activity for this. Um, if you could, uh, this is a link to a document on the RTI network about distinguishing between tier two and tier three instruction and intervention. I think I can throw this link in the chat for everyone too. And that should take you to an article on the RTI action network. Uh, and we're gonna do a little breakout room activity for about 15 minutes with your teams regarding this. So in this amount of time, we know that you're not gonna be able to read the full article in depth and really digest it in that manner. We would encourage you to do that back at your sites. It is a really um, good article, a uh, very helpful article, especially if you're kind of in that place where like we have tier two, but like how do we make tier three different? This is probably a good thing to help with that. Uh, um, but for the purposes of today, we're, we're going to have you skim and focus on this table one right here mainly. Uh, so if you, if you have the article open and you scroll down about a third of the way, you should see this table um, that has a number of factors and then how that they might different, be different um, across tier two and or tier three. Then in your handouts, um, in the uh, live binder, you should have this rating guide. So what we're gonna ask you to do is to take about five minutes um, to kind of review this table and any other part of the article you can kind of skim and digest in that time. And then as a team, um, take about 10 minutes and look at this rating guide and see how well you have these various things in place. All right. Are there any questions before we open our breakout rooms? I just reposted a live binder in the chat for everyone, as well as the link to the document. So when I open the breakout rooms, you do have the option to be able to choose your own breakout room. That only tends to work for about five or six people. So if you haven't renamed, I'll kindly ask to put the number of your team in front of your name. Um, and I'm going to get you in your breakout rooms as efficiently as possible. Yes. We ready to open those? Yeah, and just be ready to maybe identify someone as like a note taker slash speaker who can kind of just give a brief summary of what your group talked about and a brief overview of, of your rating, not necessarily in depth, but just kind of some main takeaways from that. Okay, I'm going to open those rooms. If you can join, uh, go right ahead. And if not, I'm going to be here looking at that number first, getting you in the correct breakout room. Are we ready? Go. <laughs> okay, uh, Owen J. Roberts, um, on this slide, I'm not, I don't have the exact number of it here. You have the link to uh, this article here, and they put it in the chat for you. Um, we're asking you to review that article for several minutes as a team, specifically focused on this table one here in the article. Uh, just kind of discuss that as it relates to um, differentiating tier two, tier three. And then we're asking you to rate your current tier three using uh, this handout that is in the live finder. I know someone had said the live finder wasn't working for them. We may be able to get a Google link to that document or if your other team member can access it, as long as one team member can pull up this document, you should be able to complete the activity. Does that help? Yes, thank you. 
Okay. So the breakout rooms are open. I'm assigning people. Thank you to everyone who got that number. I'm able to do this pretty quickly with the number. And thank you, Silky, for getting the tier three rating guide into the chat. So if you are having difficulty accessing the live finder, you should be able to download that PDF directly from the chat. Can you allow screen sharing permission to the participants? I should be able to. Okay. Yeah. Recording. Recording. Okay. So I did, and you can get some kind of escape condition responses from these students as well. So we may need to pull in. Uh, some behavior type assessments and interventions to support students at this level as well. All right, so we, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Erica Kruger, and she is going to discuss the learning hierarchy with us, which is an important factor to consider when considering intensifying instructions as well. So as I'm getting set up, uh, post in the chat if you know about how long, without looking ahead, Without, about how long the instructional hierarchy has been a decision-making heuristic to help us with instructional matching. Either post the year or about how long it's been <laughs> since it's been introduced. See if anyone, <laughs> watch the chat, Drew. We'll see if anyone gets that. So this is just a quick review. Um, we've talked about this before. Dr. Burns addressed it in class-wide intervention. Just checking the chat. All right, it's been around a while. Um, so what the instructional hierarchy does is helps, let's see. All right, close, even more. Good guesses though. Springfield, Dr. Jenkins. Um, since 1978, it helps to describe that academic skill prog progression and breaks down stages of learning that helps us with that instructional match. What's the right instructional approach to use well, for a student who is in that stage of learning and development of that skill. And so this brings about an important idea uh, that really sets the foundation for a multi-tiered system, whether it's tier one, whether it's tier two, whether it's class-wide, tier 1.5, tier three, when we don't align skill development with appropriate corresponding instructional approaches. They've done research on this and Dr. Burns talked about it in his session. We have a student who's performing at the frustration range, but they're provided with a fluency building intervention instead of acquisition. We don't see growth and vice versa. So uh, we see the best growth whenever the instructional approach is aligned to the appropriate learning stage. Yes, closer to 50. All right. So um, just kind of a quick review. If the student is in an acquisition stage. Um, if the student is in an acquisition stage, what that means is they haven't had enough help. If they're in a fluency building stage, this is where we really increase those opportunities to respond even more so. They haven't had enough practice. And then as we get into generalization and adaptation, they haven't had to do it that way. Are they able to generalize to other areas? Are they able to make um, adaptations to that skill? So uh, what we see in the learning hierarchy is when students are in an acquisition phase, um, they are inaccurate. They are new, they are learning that. So if we all were in person and I tried to teach you a new dance today, we would all start out and be inaccurate with our MTSS dance or whatever we may be learning. Um, so the goal would be, we do some repetition of that skill 
uh, repeat it consistently and accurately. So I might do some explicit modeling. I might wander around the room, do some guided practice, give you some immediate corrective feedback, a lot of praise and encouragement. It's not easy to get up and dance in front of everyone, right? Um, same thing academically, as students are learning a brand new skill, we utilize these techniques. Uh, and that is the approach that we're going to want to use. We wouldn't want to run through once and have you do it fast before you acquired accuracy with it. So in the learning hierarchy, uh, students are accurate but slow. So our goal then is to help them maintain accuracy and increase the speed with which they do it. So in our example, if we're learning a new dance, We've got the moves down. Now we've got to do it to the beat of the music at a, at a good speed so that it all flows nicely. So instructional approaches, when we're trying to get students to move from that acquisition to fluency building, uh, this is the time when independent practice is appropriate. When we're practicing independently, when we don't quite have that skill, that can lead to a lot of frustration, students uh, doing things incorrectly. So in fluency building stage, this is when we have opportunities to respond. We're providing feedback, not only on fluency, but still looking at accuracy, providing a lot of praise and encouragement. So we definitely don't wanna give homework on things where students are in an acquisition phase. They're not able to do it independently yet. As we're trying to build fluency or even generalization, that's um, whenever independent is uh, more appropriate. So generalization, we can't apply to a novel setting. Um, our goal is to help students apply that skill to appropriate situations. So we might have them use the target skill regularly, um, opportunities to review and practice that target skill, helping them differentiate how that's similar, um, how that's alike to other skills that may be similar. And finally, um, adaptation. Students are fluent, accurate with that skill. And that's just continuous. There's no exit criteria for it. So we might have them um, work on some self-regulation strategies, for example. Um, in math, this might be when we use schema-based instruction. But our goal really, when we are working with students who are having difficulty, is we want to get them fluent up to a level of mastery with that skill. So just a few examples here. Um, for reading and for math, just some kind of guidelines, general guidelines. So for reading, when we're working in connected text, uh, we might see slow and poor accuracy, accuracy at levels less than 93%. And then when we're looking at specific sub skills within that accuracy less than 90%. In math, elementary computation, we might see this as measured um, digits correct per minute, how many digits correct in computation problems students uh, get correctly in one minute. And so that lets us know where we need acquisition strategies. For fluency, um, connected text, students are slow. They're getting good accuracy though in that range of 93 to 97%. And sub skills, they're, it, getting uh, accuracy percentages greater than 90%. In mathematics computation, we're seeing students move closer uh, to 30 digits correct per minute. Then as we get to um, being able, you know, they've kind of are reaching that mastery level for generalization of connected text, we've got good rate, um, good oral reading rate, good accuracy greater than 97%. And in math computation for elementary students, dependent upon the skill, 40 digits correct per minute or greater. Um, and we're maintaining that through adaptation. So I'm going to briefly preview, um, going to briefly preview intensifying instruction. We're going to get into this much more after the break. I'm just going to do a quick preview of this, and then we will take a 15-minute break. So although we would really like to find responsiveness at core instruction to meet the needs of all students at Tier 1, um, some students, that level of support just isn't sufficient to help them reach those minimum levels of expected competency. So Tier 1, um, you know, we, we might need to do things to help increase instructional intensity for our students who aren't responding to tier one supports. 
So we can kind of consider a few different um, core anchors for intensifying instruction, particularly when the trend in a child's responsiveness to instruction and intervention suggests we really need to make a timely change. So these are different anchors that we can that we can look at as we maybe um, intensify our instructional approaches. So things like teacher-student ratio, um, amount of time or dosage, formative assessment to help us focus on um, skills. You know, what has the student already mastered? We don't need to spend time on that. What's the purposeful content focus? What are the areas that are most important um, for students to um, master prerequisite skills and then be able to perform later skills? What are those things we really need to be able to prioritize in our content? For math, for example, um, numbers and operations, ratios and pro proportions, uh, getting students to be algebra ready, proficient algebra, you know, what are those areas that we need to spend our, the most of our focus on? Explicitness and teacher direction increase. So as students, when you think about the instructional hierarchy, if students are having difficulty um, acquiring new skills and new concepts, then this isn't the time to give them more practice. This is the time to give them more explicit instruction, more teacher direction. Uh, Instruction on strategies as well. What are different strategies that students can use to engage in problem solving? And finally, response opportunities. We want to be able to see more opportunities for students to be able to respond. So this is going to increase as students move toward a fluency building stage of that skill. But those are just some anchors that we want to think about as we are intensifying um, instructions. This, this document should be in your handouts. So, you know, what's the rationale for, for um, intensifying instruction? We can help provide access to all students through equitable practices. Um, we can help provide information on intensification of instruction for families, for educators, and that helps provide us uh, valuable information about student progress. It can be characterized as having more instruction uh, that is explicit and systematic and more targeted in nature. So this can help maximize learning for students who have not yet met, met the goals for benchmark or, um, or have exceeded the criterion for risk. So it really helps us to accelerate students in their work, um, allowing the, the achievement gap to be closed at a more ambitious rate. So as you go through that document, you can see the different um, anchors and additional information uh, about, you know, the amount of time, the amount of dosage, for example. So um, I think what we'll do is at this point, we will take a quick break. And then when we, do we have this as a breakout room or a chat? I think that's just supposed to be a chat activity. Maybe okay. they can look at that over the break and we can revisit that. Um, what we, yeah, so what we will do is we will take our, our 15 minute break. Um, as you return from break, start posting in the chat and answer some of these questions. You know, take a glance at that document. Which instructional intensification techniques would you use for a student who's in the acquisition stage of learning? And which intensification techniques would you use for a student who is in the fluency stage of learning? And I may have given you some hints already. So I'm going to um, stop share. Well, I'll leave this up. So we will take our break and we will return at 1010. So we'll return at 1025. And when we return, you'll post in the chat thinking about which of these strategies are best for acquisition, which are best matched for fluency. And I'll continue to which of these strategies you can put an A. I'm seeing some responses coming in the chat already. Thank you. Um, which might be best aligned when a student is in an acquisition phase of learning. So put like an A. Uh, put an F for fluency, and maybe it's appropriate for both. You could put AF. 
So of these um, different areas of instructional intensification, think about which might be more appropriate for acquisition, which might be more appropriate for fluency, and are there some that are more appropriate for both? Post your thoughts in the chat. Yeah, so very, uh, some great stuff coming in. Acquisition, more teacher direction, uh, strategy instruction, fluency, purposeful content for both. Um, have explicit instruction and modeling, guided practice, immediate corrective feedback, think alouds in acquisition. Opportunities to respond, those are going to increase during fluency for sure. Okay, all right, thank you. So we're seeing, seeing some patterns here. Um, response opportunities are going to definitely be increasing during fluency, although students need a lot of opportunities for response during acquisition, but it's going to be more explicit and under teacher direction versus independent response opportunities for fluency building. All right, great. And some are appropriate for both, right? Um, purposeful content focus. Um, formative assessment is going to help us with all of those. All right. Great, so thank you. And just uh, real quick before I turn this over to Drew, um, the examples of engaging instruction to increase equity in education. There is a really nice resource from the Center on PBIS, uh, Positive Behavioral Interventions and Supports from the National Center. But one of the, um, one of, kind of the findings and recommendations is that when we have engaging instruction with uh, a, a, a high level of student engagement, um, we wanna be able to use these strategies to help all students in, be engaged in the classroom. So this brief is, and I will try and post it in the chat as well. I will, as soon as I stop screen share, um, provides uh, responsive instruction and opportunity for all students when core is engaging. So it describes a lot of different um, strategies to help teachers every day in the classroom uh, to be able to use uh, for, for students um, to increase motivation and engagement. And so a few of those equitable instructional practices include explicit instruction. We want to be able to build and prime background knowledge, recognizing the knowledge that students already bring to the classroom, increasing opportunities to respond and providing performance feedback. As we progress through today's content, consider uh, referring to this resource to see critical features and then guiding questions for um, instruction. For example, did we lead all students uh, through doing it on their own it, and provide some explicit instruction? Do we have basic understanding of our students' cultures, uh, background information that they may bring to the classroom, participation, and understanding of new knowledge? So did we build and prime that background knowledge? Are we providing equitable opportunities to respond. We're not calling on one student at a time, but using things like whiteboards, using technology, using choral responding to give all students opportunities to respond. Um, and did we uh, finally give performance feedback to let students know in, in multiple ways how they're progressing? So just a helpful resource, we are done with break and I'm going to turn it over to Drew at this point. Thank you, Charles. Thank you, Erica. I'm just going to get this uh, set up here. Give me a moment. Okay, and we should be good to go. Okay, so we are going to talk uh, for the remainder of um, today really about data based individualization. And data based individualization is a problem solving framework and a model for intervention intensification. 
Uh, you can find a lot of information about it here on the National Center on Intensive Interventions website. Uh, they have some nice uh, resources and articles there at the link that you can find about much of what we're going to discuss in the closing uh, kind of section of this morning's uh, session. So before we get too deep into that, though, what is intensive intervention? So intensive intervention should always be evidence-based. Evidence-based practices that significantly improve, improve growth in reading, mathematics, behavior, and social-emotional outcomes. So thinking about effect sizes, probably 0 0.4, 0 0.5 or higher is what we're looking for there, right? Increased intensity and individualization. So tier two may be more group um, oriented, uh, more efficient in that manner. But as we're moving uh, from tier two into tier three, and even from core instruction to tier two, we are increasing the intensity and individualization that we are providing to students. And then again, particularly with our complex and most um, intensive needs students, um, sophisticated interpretation of data uh, to inform instruction and intervention is going to be um, critical. Uh, we really need to increase levels of engagement. Uh, we need to get close the gap type of growth. So that could be an above typical growth on your Acadians STPs uh, or however your system defines that. But we know that we need to get catch up growth. Just um, typical growth isn't going to cut it for these students. And hopefully through that increased growth, we're getting uh, better access to core instruction for these students as their skills increase to a level that they can access that instruction better and with less uh, scaffolding and differentiation. So who needs the most intensive intervention, a la who needs tier three? Um, so these should be students who have, who have been persistently um, have acute behavioral and or academic challenges, right? Students who have had inadequate response to less intense um, instructional uh, attempts like core instruction or tier two supports and services. Students with sufficiently low academic achievement skills, right? So that could be defined as the 15th percentile or below and or students with significant behavioral needs. And students who are not showing above typical growth, which what we, what we define as adequate progress in meeting uh, their individuals, um, individualized education program goals. Some more characteristics of intensive intervention. This is a process. It's an ongoing process. It's not a one-time thing. Um, it's going to require school teams to uh, assess and consider a number of different variables instructionally, um, environmentally that need to be manipulated to support the student. It's going to include sharing our response to intervention data with families and students. Again, at this level, we're often going to have to integrate academic behavior and cell methodologies given uh, the, the unique interplay of those three things across students that have this level of support and need. It should be clearly documented, right? So anyone should be able to kind of come in, pick up the plan and know, know all the details, who, what, where, when, why, et cetera. Um, and that's gonna be important for fidelity to make sure things are happening and are happening the way they were intended to happen so that when the student doesn't respond, we know it's due to an instructional variable, not a fidelity variable. Uh, intensive interventions should be delivered in small groups uh, daily and for however long the student needs it. And we saw some of those times with the article as well, looking at 15 to 30 versus 30 to 45 or longer. It could include linguistic and cultural supports depending on the needs of the student. And it should be malleable, right? Uh, these are things that we can modify uh, and deliver with more intensity as the learning needs of our students tell us that's what they need, okay? So a little phrase I always liked from the old precision teaching literature was the learner is never wrong, right? If what we're doing is not working for a student, um, you know, we need to kind of come together and figure out a plan and find something that does work for that student. All right, uh, this graphic here is the graphic that goes with our database individualization uh, framework from um, the National Center on Intensive Intervention. However, I want to just kind of briefly look at this. This is a problem solving framework, right? So the problem solving process is the application of the scientific method to everyday problems encountered by schools. Uh, much like the learning hierarchy, this framework has been around for a long time, dating back to the 70s. Okay, And it generally has four phases. And there we've seen multiple iterations of this in various areas. 
but they all follow the same kind of broad framework of four phases with a problem identification, problem analysis, plan development, and plan implementation and evaluation. So all those phases are embedded in our DBI process that we're gonna take a look at. So when we think about the first stage of the problem solving process, we're in problem identification. And here it's really important to define that problem in a very clear and measurable terms and making for sure we're defining the problem in terms that are able to be manipulated and controlled by a school and, and the school environment. Uh, so if we're starting with that validated intervention program, be it a tier two standard protocol, our evidence-based core, et cetera, and then we're going to screen and or progress monitor students while they're receiving that instruction. Based on that data, it's going to tell us which students are having a problem and what the magnitude of their problem is. And that way we can look at allocating those uh, resources to those students. Another thing to consider here too can be, is the problem presented the right problem? Uh, just a brief example of that. I know in my career, I encountered a lot of uh, requests for consultation and support around like moderately disruptive classroom behaviors. Um, when you get in there and you find out that the cause of that is that these are students that really lacked fluency and grade level skills in academics. They weren't our most neediest students, but they certainly were not where they needed to be. And um, just addressing the behavior concerns of those students wasn't going to be adequate. So we had to look at the right problem. And the right problem in that situation was these students are showing some disruptive behavior in response to academics that aren't a good instructional match, right? So sometimes the problem that's presented may not be the root cause of the problem that we need to solve. Um, at this stage too, we wanna to create a problem statement that's clearly summarizing the problem. Um, this student is reading 52 words correct per minute when at this time and grade, they should be reading 90 words correct per minute, right? They are functioning at 50% of the level of performance that we'd like them to be. And then again, that includes that current level of performance compared to the desired level of performance. Your screening and benchmark tools should allow you to derive that information too. Uh, once we've identified that problem, we need to analyze it. And this is where our diagnostic data and diagnostic assessment comes into play and is so important. Um, because of all the variables we've talked about, whether it be learning hierarchy or what the student's unique skill profile is, et cetera, all those things are going to go into the decision-making process of what's the best intervention for this student that's going to work um, and get us the results that we need. So we need to create a hypothesis as to why this problem's occurring. Um, you can look at skill deficits and or performance deficits. Both of those things could be at play. Again, we've talked about the need to integrate problem solving at this level as well. And then we need to gather some data to support or refute those hypotheses. And that's our diagnostic, diagnostic assessment, right? We think that this is maybe caused by an underlying word level reading problem uh, with some phonological skill deficits. Then we need to go out and get the data that supports that and says, yes, that's correct. Or no, we need to look somewhere else. Again, at this stage, it's really important to consider the stage of the learning hierarchy that the student is with those skills. Students who need acquisition learning are not gonna benefit from fluency interventions and vice versa. Uh, and the sooner we can match them to the appropriate intervention, the better and, and quicker their response is gonna be. And then again, we need to focus on alterable factors that we can manipulate in the school environment. So once we have created and tested and confirmed that hypothesis, we have to create a plan to close the gap between current and ideal levels of performance. Uh, this involves creating a goal with measurable outcomes. Goals are incredibly important because they become kind of the standard by which we're measuring our progress against, right? Uh, and I know one thing that we do know is that um, more stringent goals are gonna cause more um, probably instructional um, changes based on students maybe not meeting those goals. So having a good rigorous goal is gonna be important to get students uh, where we can. Again, we want them to be ambitious, but realistic. Uh, most systems um, with the SGPs now do have really kind of nice and simple ways to kind of um, develop a goal that is within a range that is achievable, but also should close the achievement gap for students. So I would encourage you to uh, take advantage of those resources uh, within Acadians, Ames Web, or whichever system you're using. Uh, we need to have a plan for collecting our outcome data, right? Our progress monitoring data and, and collecting that. We also need to have a plan for evaluating if the intervention was implemented as designed, right? 
Uh, there's ample research that says most interventions in schools fail because they simply weren't implemented as designed. So uh, ensuring that that's not a factor is going to save you time when it comes to trying to figure out why your intervention may not be working. And it should save you instructional time in terms of getting students um, to respond better to interventions as well. And then we need to make sure we have the adequate um, resources to support uh, the implementation we want to we want to implement. And then schedule those progress reviews. That's that six to eight weeks uh, where the team is regathering and looking and reviewing data and having those individual students uh, meetings for students who aren't giving a, um, showing the response that we'd like to see. And then finally, at that time, we need to do our plan evaluation. So has our plan been successful? If so, we can maintain it. Do we need to decrease the intensity or discontinue? Is this student ready for a less intense level of support or do we need to stay the course a little bit longer uh, until those uh, skills shore up and are a little bit more in place? If the plan's unsuccessful, we're just revisiting kind of that diagnostic data intervention adaptation progress monitoring phases of the graphic, right? Uh, some things to consider are, did we have the right hypothesis as to why this student wasn't achieving the way we wanted them to? Was our intervention efforts, were they implemented with integrity? Um, do we have the right intervention to problem match? Are there other contextual factors that we need to consider in supporting this student? Um, that could be, again, pulling in things related to motivation, cell, executive skills, family supports, et cetera. Uh, so those are just some areas to consider if your plan isn't working. So that's just some general kind of basic theoretical stuff. Uh, we're going to specifically look at the steps of this database indiv individualization process. Um, then we'll look at some examples and hopefully you'll have some time to look at some of your own data and apply these uh, methods, these steps to, to your own case study. But again, step one of DBI is going to be to deliver an evidence-based methodology. This is a validated intervention that's matched to student need and with fidelity. So that is step one. Step two is to progress monitor the intervention. Now, if our progress monitoring data suggests that we are not getting the results that we need, that's when we move into step three and conduct a diagnostic assessment. Based on that diagnostic assessment, we're gonna make adaptations to the intervention. We're gonna talk about some quantitative adaptations and some qualitative adaptations we can make to a standard protocol intervention to increase its intensity. And then step five, we're gonna continue the cycle of progress monitoring, analysis, and adaptation as needed, right? So even if we do this one time and it doesn't work, we revisit those steps and go back to kind of developing hypotheses for why the student isn't achieving, collecting data to kind of support and confirm those and adapting the intervention. I would also say this applies to students who have already been identified for special education as well, right? This process should not stop because a student uh, receives an exceptionality and an IEP, right? Like this process is for all, all students at that intensive need of intervention, so not just students in tier three supports. So looking a little closer at step one, deliver an evidence-based validated intervention program with increasing intensity. Some things that you can consider here, I think the obvious ones are obviously adjusting the group size, um, right? So we do know that um, decreasing that student to teacher ratio in these groups can increase the intensity, right? It's gonna allow for a little bit more individualized kind of attention to each student in the group. Also adding more instructional time, like an additional 15 minutes. So if the intervention was only scheduled to take 30 minutes, add an additional 15 intervention, um, minutes of intervention time. So for example, uh, Drew will receive a total of 45 minutes of intervention per day, rather than 30 in a group of three, rather than five. So we're increasing that time and decreasing that group size. We're gonna do some stamping activities with this. Uh, those of you that haven't stamped before, I have some brief uh, instructions on the page here. Uh, if you can't figure out the stamping tool, that's okay too. You can also just uh, populate your answers in the chat, but some people find the, uh, the stamping to be fun. So across the ribbon at the top of your screens, you should have a view options with a little carrot next to it. If you click on that carrot and select the annotate feature, you should then be able to select a stamp and pick your type of stamp. 
I would just, while we're here on this screen too, I would say when um, we are done stamping, uh, you may need to uh, select your uh, mouse pad back from the annotate features here as well. So again, if you know how to stamp and are comfortable and can figure this out from the directions, we'll encourage you to stamp. If not, feel free to participate using the chat. But in thinking of what we just talked about and being able to, to deliver an evidence-based intervention, uh, validated intervention or program with increasing intensity, how is that going at your school and your site within your process? Is it completely missing? Do you kind of sort of have it in place or are you doing great? You have a menu of options that target different instructional needs that your team can act, um, choose from efficiently. Okay. Looks like the stamping is going well. Okay. Uh, all right. Just real quick visual inspection kind of places majority of teams in the middle that they have maybe some options, but maybe need to expand those options uh, of validated intervention programs um, that match the student need. All right. Thank you for clearing that. I'm going to assume that was Dr. Kruder. She is our resident stamping expert. All right, step two. So we've implemented that validated intervention progress. The next step is to select progress monitoring measures. We want to select things that align to our skills being targeted and are predictive of success in broader rather than more narrow curricular domains. Okay, so that usually means using some kind of GOM or general outcome measure. Um, oral reading fluency in reading is a great uh, way to monitor um, progress that's also predictive of broader uh, curricular domains. But you may need to uh, use something else, maybe some more formative assessment, something that's going to measure the subskills that you're targeting and align more closely to your intervention. So what we're trying to do here is balance um, gathering information that shows you if your day to day instructional efforts are working versus is the student progressing towards more broader uh, curricular goals than just what this one skill I've been teaching in the intervention group. So having a combination of measures is usually the best way to do that. Setting a high but realistic goal is also important because that is going to signal us whether we need to make more instructional changes or not. But again, there's gonna be a point of diminishing return on that, right? If we set the goal too high, no matter what we do, the student's likely not going to achieve that. So we gotta try and find that sweet spot of high but realistic growth. And then monitor your response. You progress monitor once a week. You, um, no reason to progress monitor more than twice a week with a GOM. Uh, there's no, no more return you're gonna get on that. Um, twice a week can get you good information, but more than that's not necessary. And once a week is probably sufficient, depending, unless you're in some kind of a hurry, right? If you're working with a student and um, a request to avow came in and you have to get more data points quicker, maybe you would want to increase that. But in general, once a week should be sufficient. Uh, all right. And then you can use your SGPs, such as Pathways of Progress or the Ames Web SGPs, FastBridge, whatever system you're using. Uh, you can also use rate of improvement as well. Um, you can use them in tandem if you would like. Um, hopefully uh, you're looking at growth from multiple ways um, and not just, not just one metric there. All right, so back to the stamping. Um, how are we doing with progress monitoring practices? How are your teams and sites doing with progress monitoring practices? Seems like a lot of people are fairly confident with what they're doing. They've got some things in place maybe need to improve on. And we've got a lot of, a lot of teams that feel that they're doing a very strong job with that as well. Okay. So after step, step two, we use our progress monitoring data to identify students who aren't responding, are in danger of not meeting their goals or not closing the gap. Uh, and for those students, then we wanna connect a diagnostic assessment. All right, so we have many uh, tools at our disposal when doing said diagnostic assessment. Um, you have an individually administered standardized measures, right? Um, that could include the tower, the test of word reading efficiency, uh, the CTOP, the comprehensive test of phonological processing. 
you could pull in individual subtests from a more broadband achievement measure like the Wyatt 3 or the Woodcock Johnson or the Kaufman. Um, depends on the questions you want to answer, which um, tools and subtests you might want to use. Uh, you could do survey level assessment. That is a curriculum based assessment method where you simply test backwards through a series of skills until you find the foundational skills that the student's ready to work on. Uh, you can use criterion referenced assessment. So thinking about a phonics uh, screener like core phonics has one press uh, manual has one. I believe the 95% group also has a phonics screener for intervention. There are similar tools out there for um, phonemic awareness, phonological awareness. Uh, for math at this level, you're really looking at using the individual skill probes as part of that survey level assessment. That's going to probably be the best way to go about that. Uh, error analysis is another tool at our disposal. What types of errors are our students making? Uh, pull whatever formative assessment data you have from interventions, et cetera. And always uh, teachers are a valuable source of information as well. So real brief uh, interview with teachers as to maybe what skills the student's missing. Are they acquiring skills? Are they not acquiring skills? Are they not retaining skills from day to day? Can all help you kind of make some hypotheses about what skills and what learning hierarchy stage we are in. Some rogue stampers here. <laughs> All right, so how is this at your uh, current at your site in your process? Um, or do we have some diagnostic assessment in? Are we missing it? Are we are we knocking diagnostic assessment out of the park? So again, it looks like many of us are in the category of we have some things in place in terms of diagnostic assessment, but we probably could improve our practices there a little bit. And then a few sites really need to kind of build that um, in, and a couple of sites feel that they're doing a, a bang up job with that. So um, step four, we're going to look at adaptation of the intervention. So when we talked about group size and adding time to an intervention, those are intervention adaptations, but those are more quantitative ones, kind of making some changes around the length and the group size there. We're going to talk a little bit about some qualitative changes that you can make to the intervention. We are still preserving the fidelity of the intervention, right? We don't want to delete components or change the way that our standard protocol is delivered per se. But there are things that we can do to alter that intervention that still work to preserve the fidelity and enhance and intensify the intervention, right? So you can always build in more response opportunities to that intervention, right? That's something that you can add on your own while still maintaining the integrity that that, that intervention has. You can give increased feedback to students. You can add in increased use of modeling, um, add in that increased amount of guided practice, that we do time, that can be a big area to qualitatively intensify an intervention is to just increase um, that amount of guided practice time and feedback during that practice, right? Uh, you can add in you, the increased use of certain graphics, uh, manipulatives, or think alouds, or strategy instruction, et cetera. Sometimes you may need to add an additional area to target. Um, maybe your the intervention you selected is not strong enough on phonemic awareness for the students. So rather than switching an entire intervention, you can just pull in some additional phonemic awareness resources. Always be mindful of fluency and how well your intervention is targeting fluency of those subskills, um, you know, vocabulary, et cetera. This is all going to depend on what your diagnostic data says about your student and how well um, the intervention you have is a match to the student's diagnostic needs. And again, you could add contingencies for motivation, behavior support plans, you could add an executive skills component, uh, you could add performance feedback, et cetera. Um, these are all things that we can do to augment a pre-existing standard protocol intervention. Okay, so, We'll have this graphic again as well, because these are again, these match up to a lot of what we're saying we can alter in terms of a qualitative adaptation to an intervention, right? Um, or quantitative as well. When we look at student to teacher ratio, the amount of time, increasing formative assessment is going to give you increased information about whether students are mastering the skills you're teaching and what level of the, what stage of the learning hierarchy they're in there. 
formative assessment is also going to cue you to make instructional changes more frequently too, which in and of itself has been shown to have almost a effect size of one on student achievement. Um, making sure that that content is focused on the areas that our student needs, that we're maximizing time spent on the skills that the student is missing and minimizing time spent covering skills that the student maybe doesn't need um, or isn't showing that intense of a need for. Is, um, is it explicit and teacher directed, right? Thinking about our interventions there, uh, strategy instruction and response opportunities. So these are all those variables that can be used to intensify an existing intervention while preserving its fidelity. Um, some additional changes are areas you can consider when making these qualitative changes too or kind of discussed again. These relate back to the taxonomy of intervention um, intensification that's on the NCII site, I believe. So alignment is going to refer to how well our intervention matches the skills that the student is deficient in and isn't, again, isn't spending time on skills that the student isn't showing a deficit in. Another area is attention to transfer or generalization. How well does the intervention make connections between the skills taught in the intervention and the skills learned in the classroom? Uh, sometimes we do need to focus on getting students to use our the skills taught in interventions in other settings. So that could be something that we need to consider as well. Uh, comprehensiveness. Does your intervention incorporate the principles of, of explicit instructional design and delivery? Um, are they maybe missing some or lacking or not as strong in other areas? Can you do things and build things in to make that intervention more explicit? And again, back to behavior and cell support and how well does this intervention incorporate strategies to support perhaps self-regulation, motivation, and or externalizing behaviors depending on what the student you know, needs. All right. So as we're doing this process, some things to look for back to our learning hierarchy. If, we're, if our data is showing us that students are after our teaching still have poor accuracy and rate, if they're not retaining the skills taught within session or from session to session, or if they're missing prerequisite skills, then the areas we wanna consider are alignment and comprehensiveness, right? We need to get that intervention to match those students' skills. And we gotta make sure that we're having enough response opportunities, enough practice opportunities, enough modeling, enough feedback that they're retaining those skills uh, from session to session. Conversely, if our data is showing, okay, the student is accurate and retaining the skills we're teaching, but he's still not showing the rate we want him to on some of our other measures, we may need to look at dosage, okay, and giving them more time there. And then again, if we're seeing an, a student who maybe is rate and accuracy is looking good, but is not using those skills under different conditions um, than what they're taught, then that's where we might have to put in some support for transfer or generalization of the skills to get the student to do it in uh, novel settings or, or settings outside the intervention setting. So in terms of how this looks at your site, how are you, um, how would you evaluate your process of adapting interventions to make them more intense based on student data? So the general consensus here is that there are some things in place, but that this can probably be further developed um, at many of your sites, which is good because that's what we're targeting today and targeting throughout the series this year. So, all right. And then the final step is that progress monitoring and analysis and continue to the adaptation if needed. So we're gonna monitor the effects of any adaptations that we make. Um, fidelity data, and again, here having that clearly documented plan is going to be important to make sure these additional components are getting added, who's going to be doing them, when are they going to be happening, how long are we adding the additional um, components, etc. And then you're going to apply your data decision rules. That's going to be based on your uh, goal and generally how you're interpreting that, whether you're interpreting that with SGPs or however you're, you're deciding if students are progressing on their goals. And then you're going to continue to collect diagnostic data and make adaptations as needed based on your progress monitoring data. So rinse, wash, repeat. So 
So one last time with the stamper, how well would you rate your sites as engaging in that continuing monitoring analysis and adaptation? Or do we kind of get to a point where we run out of things and ideas to do for students? So again, similar to the last one, many, many sites are falling in that kind of sort of uh, range where they have something in place, but maybe need to, um, you know, do a little more robust practices in that area. Okay, we're going to take a look now uh, at some elementary and secondary case illustrations of this DBI process. Uh, we're going to have you uh, re do this in your teams again in breakout rooms so that you can kind of discuss some data. Uh, so we're going to, the uh, case studies are in the slides. If you are an elementary school, we would recommend that you look at the slides. Oops, sorry. Let me go back. We recommend that you look at slides 85 through 94. Uh, if you are a secondary site, we have a secondary case study here for you. Uh, you can check that out um, from slides 95 to 102. And as you're looking through this, think about these four questions. Are you looking at this data and interpreting it the same way or possibly differently than our team did? Uh, would you have selected the same evidence-based practices? If not, maybe what would you have selected? Would you have involved the family in a different manner? And then four is just kind of an open-ended section. Um, any other reactions or comments that you have regarding the case study and perhaps um, what your team may have done in that situation? Okay, so again, elementary, your case study is on slides 85 to 94, and secondary, your case study is going to be on slides 95 to 102. So if there are any left, are there any questions about the activity? And if everyone is good on what they need to do, we can go ahead and open those breakout rooms. So your breakout rooms should be open. If you are able to um, self-select your breakout room and join, please do that at this time. Those of you that are having some sort of technical difficulty with this, Eric and I will help to get you assigned. And the slides got bumped by just one and elementary started oh, okay. on 84. It's okay. Thank you. Thank you for catching that. I put it in the chat. Was there a Google form with questions that they answer or? No, they're answering these questions right okay. here. Questions okay. Okay. We're going to make that bit.ly link to the Google form is going to be used for their own uh, case study. Okay. Yeah, they're just answering those questions on the slide. <clears throat> okay. If no more comments, we'll open it up. Uh, those of you that looked at the secondary case study uh, for our student, Jane, what were your uh, just a summary of your overall thoughts uh, regarding that process. It sounded pretty similar to what the elementary team said when we looked at the outcome of the intervention. It looked like the, the selection of it was correct. I think the only thing that, that we questioned was it indicated after the student got the intervention and was successful, then they went back and looked and realized that there was a class-wide need. Um, and we thought that if that data had been looked at uh, on the front end, perhaps the class-wide need could have been provided in a more strategic uh, manner to support that student as opposed to the uh, support that the student did end up getting, but um, otherwise the uh, parents were involved, uh, the student made progress, so it seemed like it was a, a good response. 
Right. Yeah. So yeah, definitely best best case scenario is doing the class wide intervention first as part of your dated screening process. There, good catch there. Any other questions, uh, comments, feedback on the secondary case study? In the chat here, I believe. <laughs> yes. All right. Um, if there are no more uh, comments about this activity, we wanted to give you the opportunity to um, look at your identified case study student for the series and maybe apply this similar process. Uh, I'm going to scroll down here. Our next activity here. So we do have um, a place for you to kind of work on this, a document, and it should be labeled um, your document in the, in the bit.ly there, should have your team name assigned to it as well. Uh, but we're gonna place you back in your breakout rooms, um, use the bit.ly link, and if maybe we could get that in the chat. I'm sure someone's already put it in there. I know my patent team is always on top of that. Um, find the slide with your team name. This should be arranged alphabetically. Um, Look at the progress monitoring and diagnostic data for the student you're concerned about or a student that maybe your case study student that you've selected uh, for this uh, particular series, because basically what we're spending time on today in terms of this data-based individualization really is a key component of the series that you're working on as it relates to your case study student. Um, so maybe go through and work uh, through with that student. I know when we were on site visits, we had some time to do a little preliminary discussion around some data that maybe you could gather uh, for your student that would help you with this process as well. Maybe you have some of that data to look at at this time, but whatever data you have, uh, we would ask you to look through that um, and identify any adaptations that your team may make for this student um, as they go throughout the school year. Um, so just a couple of kind of questions there related back to the DDI steps and just apply them to your particular case study student um, and, and whatever data you have at your fingertips today. Yep, thank you for putting that bit.ly link in, Dr. Kruder. I will go ahead and open up our breakout rooms as well. If you have any questions about the activity, please let us know. Okay, welcome back from the breakout rooms all. Uh, we are at the conclusion of our session today, so we're not going to get into any sort of discussion around your individual case study students. However, we do hope to follow up with you on that um, at our upcoming case uh, or excuse me site visits as we continue to kind of go through this uh, year long process of evaluating that student and their their responsiveness to intervention. Uh, just a couple of updates or um, reminders. Uh, next session is on December 15th. At 1 p.m., we have Dr. Jack Fletcher, who's going to come in and do a really great presentation around uh, learning disability identification practices and what is best practices in uh, the identification of specific learning disabilities. So that's going to be a really great session. And then uh, I'm going to turn over to Jen, and she's going to talk about the January 12th session about the comprehensive evaluation reports for a little bit. Thanks, Drew. Uh, yeah, and I want to want to thank um, Drew and Erica and Kieran for their nice job with presenting today around a very uh, complex topic. So very, very nice job and just a great um, array of resources that we hope will be helpful to you. Um, uh, uh, another plug for, for Dr. Jack Fletcher, it's really hard um, to get him. And so um, the content that he's going to present is really, really important. So we know it's a part of your um, series requirements, but we also wanted to let you know it's open to anyone who wants to attend. Um, uh, so you'll be joined by, by others uh, that day, and that's the nap an afternoon session. Um, I wanted to talk about Dr. Tim Rungi's session that's scheduled for January 12th. Um, we're going to modify that a little bit, and I, I, we want to kind of float this by you. Um, the, the session was originally designed to focus on um, uh, evaluation reports and just sort of talking to the problem solving teams about 
um, how RTI methodologies and language related to the use of RTI folds into or, or reflects then your efforts um, with um, students who are going to go to eligibility determination within the ER. And so what we thought might be helpful is if we started out um, reviewing the three common RTI methodologies. So rate of improvement, give you a chance to look at the, the rate of improvement for your case study student, then go into student growth percentiles, which we're covering a lot with you on site, um, to include um, then the combination of looking at your case study student through uh, student growth percentiles and rate of improvement data. And then we'll also do a little bit on mastery measurement. Um, a lot of you are not tied to formal data systems that use mastery measurement um, uh, efficiently, but if you are collecting mastery data, um, that part of the session would certainly be helpful. And many of you, particularly at the secondary level, will have mastery measurement naturally embedded within uh, interventions that you're using for students, um, including our case study students at a different level. Um, and then what we thought we'd do is go a little bit deeper into some of the methodologies we've been recommending in terms of fidelity or enhanced fidelity of implementation. We know that the site visits, it's often a, a drive-by until we get to cover everything, especially the fall visits. But we do want to allow time for teams to say, okay, I know we're looking at RAVO, or I know we're looking at ECRI tier three intensification, or I know we're looking at you know, X, Y, and Z, um, maybe it would, it would behoove us as a team to take a deeper dive together and then talk to somebody who's an expert in that particular intervention around enhanced fidelity. So uh, you would choose the breakout room that corresponds with the intervention that you're using at tier three uh, with your case study student and have time to look at your diagnostic results. Um, as well as any other data that you've collected to, to again, problem solve around intensity at the tier, tier three level. Um, and then we would end with team time so that everything that you learned um, during that three hour session, anything else that's left over or that still uh, needs to be addressed, your assigned consultant would be in the, the last breakout session with your team, just be available if you need anything. So could you just give us a sense of whether that would be helpful to you or not? Jack Fletcher's session is going to be a little bit broader based um, in terms of broad recommendations for best practices and research as it relates to SLD determination. This is now this session that would follow would be more contextualized. Um, so you'd actually be applying everything to your case study student, but in a team kind of format, because we know you, you don't often get time um, to be together. So just, uh, yeah, just any feedback would be great. Okay, thank you, that's helpful. And if you have any other thoughts or needs um, that you think you'd want to, you know, um, for us to think about having time for you to do during that session, then just let, let us know uh, in the next maybe few weeks. Um, and, and remember, we have the site visits. I think, you know, that January 12th session is going to be before you collect um, for elementary, your winter benchmark data, and probably before the next round of PVAS quintile data will be released. Um, so what you will have is, is the individually administered achievement test, and then again, any other progress monitoring data you've collected. Thank you for that feedback. Um, and so we'll stay with that course of action then, that change to go beyond you know, the topic, which is ERs, to uh, differentiate a bit for all the people on a problem solving team and, and go a little bit deeper into fidelity of interventions. Um, okay, thank you. Thanks, Drew. I'm gonna share my screen, I think, because I think I am the keeper of the exit code. So uh, thank you again, everybody. And uh, on behalf of our presenters today, um, you know, terrific job, great resources. Go forth and be well. And uh, we look forward to seeing you um, on the continued site visits and then um, at Jack Fletcher's session in December. So the exit code is 5344. Um, the link is in front of you on the screen. 
And the goal would be to submit um, uh, this by 7 a.m. on November 19th. So that is Thursday, I believe, Friday. Thursday. <laughs> Friday. Oh my goodness. It's Monday. <laughs>